privacy. So lots of folks bring their own, bring the small mountain tents and set up uh, to sleep, even at those large camps. But we'll have a base there. Uh, sometimes we'll have twin otters and helicopters, or uh, just the helicopters at one of those remote sites. Can have as many as 65 people at one of those sites. We support one of those usually every two to three years at a different location in the field. In the camp, you've got the same things that you would have back at a main base. You'll have coordinating what are we going to do, figuring out our helicopter schedule for the next day. That's the senior helo pilot and the camp staff manager, and they're all working out what the plan will be for helicopter support for the following day. In the camp, you'll have one big structure. That's that old James Way structure with a knee wall that raises it up a little bit. That doubles as the dining hall and communication shack and a little place to do a little work on the table. Now you're out in the field in a big camp. You got all that stuff. You got lots of food. You need a freezer. <clears throat> so you make yourself a freezer. Just dig down. You got to get your food supplies out of the sun in the, into the shade. Instant freezer. Again, uh, that's classic Scott tent I mentioned earlier in the season, earlier in the, in the talk. That's a two, a two person operation. Two people would be living in that side that with all your gear, and I'll show you what that looks like inside. You might also have the small tent while you're out in the field and it's windy. Instead of having your tent completely drifted over, you're going to use uh, snow to make a windbreak, uh, snow blocks to make a windbreak around your tent. Also cuts down on the constant rattling of your of your tent when you're out in the field from the wind. Some of the uh, some of the camps will have a, a slightly larger tent that might be used as a cook cook tent if you say you got six or eight people out in a group and you'll have a communal uh, kitchen for a small camp. But most of them are like this. You can see the, the Scott tents down here. Now, <clears throat> how's that for a place to camp? Pretty nice. That's out in the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. Doesn't get much better than that. Of course, again, those pictures are taken on that nice, clear, calm brochure day. Now, some of the challenges of working out in a remote location are organization, weather, Communications, uh, support, you know, you're yourself supporting, there's nobody going to come out and do all that stuff for you, you have to do it yourself. Making water, food preparation, I said, making water, big issue out in the field, and safety. And of course, somewhere after you get to take care of all those things, you're going to try to get some science done where you're out, out in the field. Shelter, heat, and communications. Otherwise, you don't get left in the field. So you need to be fairly well organized to know where your initial tent is you're going to pop up, where your heater or stove is, so you can get that started, and where your communications, your either your satellite phone or your radio is. Not all science folks are necessarily good at that. I had a group working at McMurdo one year. They went out in a helicopter, got out into the field, called back and said, we don't have any matches. So we were able to talk to them on the radio to show how you could take the spark plug out of your generator, this was some years ago, when they were still using generators a lot, and pull the starter on the generator and get a spark on the spark plug to start their stove. So they were good. They stayed out for about a week, came back in the McMurdo, got ready to go back out in the field. The next day they went out, next time they went out, yeah, they had their matches. <laughs> They forgot their food. <laughs> so we had to send another helicopter out and bring them their food supplies. So they came back again and went out a third time in the field. And they had their matches. And they had their food. They forgot all their science equipment. <laughs> so the fourth time when they went out in the field, someone went with them. So we, we will recognize groups that do not necessarily, they're great scientists, but they don't necessarily have those field skills. And we have a group of people who will go with them to be their field guide 
to make sure they remember their food and their matches and their science equipment when they get out in the field. But it is good to be organized. These rock boxes are typically what the geologists will take in the field to bring their samples back. And of course, they pack all their field gear in those to go out into the field. So you get that pile, it'd be nice to know which box has the matches in them. <laughs> it's also nice to have gone carefully through all your equipment to make sure you have not forgotten an essential item, like the cover that goes over that framework. That happened. <laughs> Working in the field, you're going to work in any weather. You can see here, this is not real comfortable, blowing snow, but they still have to take advantage of that unless it's absolutely totally miserable or unsafe, they're going to be out working in the field. This is a small uh, team of geologists working in the field. Snow is always a problem. This is out at ADAP, which is that Antarctic Gambertsoff province project, that mountain range buried under the ice that we talked about in some of the other lectures. And they had a small field camp out there, and you can see after a couple of days what happens when it snows. And it snows again and again. So you're always doing a lot of work. In this kind of camp, you would have some staff that would help you. The science people aren't going to be shoveling the, the facilities out. Now here in the Antarctic Peninsula region where we just left, you guys saw perfectly a good example of what happens from day to day. This is a camp set up on Seymour Island. They're all set to go, right? This is the next day, very same location. See? Next day, same location. That's what we experienced a couple of days that we were south. The weather can change just from one day to the next, not unusual. In the peninsula, it's not the dry cold that we have in areas, other areas. We have wet cold, and it's much more difficult to deal with, in my opinion, than the dry cold. Also in the peninsula, if you're coming to shore off a large ship to be based in the shore, and you, you have to deal with this shifting ice, the pack ice. You saw a little bit of that during our cruises. These guys were getting ready to come ashore, and this suddenly blew in. And it probably took them two hours to work their way through that to get to shore. This is a, an example of also changing weather here in the peninsula. That's the Nathaniel B. Palmer tied up to the fast ice offshore. They put these flags and bamboo poles out when the weather was good, thank goodness, because you can see why they put them out. That weather turned bad. Communications is a critical item. You must check in once a day, every day, at a set time when you're out in the field. If you miss your check-in, a procedure has gone through before a search and rescue group would be launched or an aircraft diverted. We're going to look at who you are, where you are, if communications for other groups have also been poor, how much experience you have. But missed check-ins will result in a whole evolution going through. And if we're uncomfortable that you might be in trouble, a search and rescue team is going to be on the way pretty quickly. Much better today than the old days when we were using HF radios. We do have satellite capability, but in some areas, especially out, say, in the, in the mountains, you need to put repeaters in so you can see the satellite or see a bounce of signal off an antenna. So you here you see a solar-powered uh, remote uh, antenna for a repeater station out in the Dry Valley region in the mountains. I mentioned snow. I mentioned water. When you're working in Antarctica, especially in the other parts over towards McMurdo, the relative humidity is about 5%. So you dehydrate simply by breathing. So you must force yourself to drink lots and lots of fluids, quarts of water every single day. You gotta keep sucking that water down and carry it around with you in your thermos and of course, you also generate water waste, so you wind up with two bottles. One, and they've got warm water in them, so that one you throw in the bottom of your sleeping bag before you go to sleep, and that other one that you fill during the night, 
you throw that in the bottom of your sleeping bag too. Don't mix those two bottles up. The unusual. But here you can see cutting ice out of, out of one of the lakes in the dry valleys for water. Here in one of the camps, they've got a trash can full of clean snow. They're melting snow, constantly melting snow or ice. Here's a camp that has a heater in it and a configuration with a big pot on top for melting uh, snow or ice for water, for drinking water, bathing water, cooking water, cleaning supplies. You get your camp really well organized, all you have to do is lean out the window to get some snow blocks to put in the, in the pot to melt water. But it's something that you spend a huge amount of time every single day when you're out in the field. You get out in the field, sometimes you'll have guests to come to visit. This is a, in a peninsula region, so these are some elephant seals and a, a few like maybe chin, chin strap penguins have come through the camp. Um, this is another site out in the Transantarctic Mountains. Um, you can see the snow block walls built for shelter around the tents. Not a bad spot for camping out. Probably about minus 20. Fahrenheit there. You do get a nice day occasionally where it's sunny and bright and you really enjoy it. Sometimes you get visitors, these guys uh, <laughs> dropped by. Uh, and those creatures are protected under the Antarctic Treaty and the U.S. Antarctic Conservation Act, so you, you can't chase them away or hit them or make them try to go somewhere else, they go where they want to go. And for some reason or other, they were attracted to that blue and yellow tent. And then he took a nap for a while, and then they left, and you can tell they left a little, yes, that is exactly what you think it is. Um, that was funny. That was not my camp. <laughs> This is a camp that I was in uh, in uh, 1994, working uh, out in the shear zone to find that way through the crevasse field uh, for the traverse. And one of the things that we did is most of the equipment we used out in the field was powered by, all the equipment was powered by batteries, either computers or uh, the radios, electronics stuff for the uh, ground penetrating radar. And we uh, said, we don't want to really run that noisy, smelly gasoline generator. So we put solar panels on the side of the tent, one on all four sides. So we got to use the sunlight. Solar panels, solar cells actually work more efficiently when they're cold. So we never used the generator at this camp at all. Oh. All powered by solar cells. So you can see the array of Scott tents. Again, that little uh, ventilation tube at the top of the tent. Um, one of those is me, I can't tell which, uh, out in the field. And you can see um, little flags around. Anytime you're out in the field, you have to put the flags around because the next morning you get up and all that stuff you left outside of your tent is buried in snow and you have to find it again. Get out in the field, that classic Nansen sled with uh, canvas a uh, cargo bag on and all your equipment goes in there. This is actually us working our way through that crevasse field. You can see a, a rope here goes from the one individual, another rope up to the to the mosquito in front and the individual driving that is roped up, the series of ropes. The person who was really your friend, we were like four of us, four motor toboggans in a row all roped together. The person on the last motor toboggan you really, really wanted him to be paying attention because if the first one fell in the crevasse, he was your break. That didn't happen. Honestly, it didn't happen. That's my wife. Uh, always windy out in the field, so at the end of the day, you have to cover everything up, even the motor toboggans. You wanted to put that cover over them, otherwise, totally packed with snow in the morning. And it's a real pain to have to get in there and clean your engine off with all the snow that's packed around it. This is a good day out in the field, and it happened to be sunny and calm, so we dragged the, the cooking gear outside. 
and cooked outside, but most of the time you wind up cooking inside a tent. I know nobody does that when they camp, but in the Antarctica that's a standard practice. The small mountain tents, this is what it would look like for one individual and a little bit of their gear inside, sleeping in that tent. This is what it looks like when you're trying to stay warm. You can see the eyeballs sticking out. Uh, sometimes you have a little problem when you're breathing and all this would get covered with frost here and then when you roll around all that ice would fall inside your sleeping bag so sometimes you just rolled over and had the opening on the bottom side but that's what you wind up doing. In the bottom of your bag are those two bottles that I mentioned earlier plus your socks and maybe your boots are thrown in the bottom of your sleeping bag. Again you see all the flags marking the gear that's outside so when you get a snow or blowing snow and everything drifts over you can find all that equipment the next day and again the, the solar panels on the side of the tent. That's the configuration inside a Scott tent. You have this little setup with your uh, Coleman stove, your ever-present big bucket for melting water and your food and stuff and you just cook on that, that stove. Sleeping bag on either side. Amazing what you would eat in the field. I can remember one time we cooked up about a pound of bacon. Uh, we ate all the bacon, me and my tent mate, and then we took some pieces of bread and sopped up all the bacon grease and ate that too. Got to keep the furnace filled. This uh, occasionally uh, you would invite guests over. You can squeeze four people into a, a Scott tent and have uh, dinner together, but it's it's pretty tight as you can see in the field. Uh, and again, the mandatory requirement, this is in the old days when we used HF radios, mandatory requirement to check in every single day at a preset time before uh, somebody comes looking for you. Um, so that's what it's like when you're out in the field. Um, my kids call those snot sickles. <laughs> So that's what it's like um, when you really want to go camping, spend some time winter camping. Uh, it's, it's spectacular. And occasionally you'll get to see something like that. I got about a couple of minutes for questions. Patrick's got a mic over here. He'll run around and we'll answer a few questions. And then a, a flight center that's manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week, max center. So all the aircraft are checking in with there. All the schedules are set up there. Uh, in the Peninsula region, there's not too much flying, but the Chileans have a runway and they have a flight center there that anybody that's flying in and out. That's the only runway that I know of in the Peninsula. And most of the flying in the interior is done by the U.S. So, but we are, we're not too concerned about uh, air traffic control, but we have air traffic controllers at McMurdo that uh, manage the flights in and out of McMurdo Station usually have about six or seven departures and, and returns a day out of McMurdo during the summer. Uh, 